This is our. Uh, You're being recorded. Okay. Well, welcome. This is our uh, fourth in-person meeting uh, since uh, the pandemic broke out. Uh, what almost three years ago now. Um, I want to thank those who made it here and those who are joining us via Zoom. Uh, before we get into sort of the meaty parts of the business, I want to have a couple of our members make just a couple of announcements about some of the activities that we're interested in making sure people know about and uh, maybe recruit some people to uh, participate in. Uh, Tim, I think you wanted to say a few words about the scholarship committee and scholarship group. That's the camera. Thanks. Uh, I'm happy to. Um, we have money for scholarships. We have a generous donation from the Oregon Community Foundation and also from our members going back in years. And so we, fact, we in fact have thousands of dollars. Now, a scholarship program really needs two, three essential things. You need applicants, someone to choose them, and money. All we have is the money. I need a couple more people to volunteer to help me vet applicants. So people are asking for help. So if you'd like to volunteer to work with that, it's not much time really. I will send you an email when we get an application. We look at it, we decide very quickly, yes, no, and then we inform the happy winners. But we also need applicants. No one is asking for this money, which surprises me month after month after month. Um, we really do have thousands of dollars and we're happy to help you if, uh, if you have any financial need in order to take the kinds of classes that the Guild offers. Can they use it for membership? We haven't decided that. Okay. I think you could. I think you could certainly do it for renewal. Maybe not the first time, but maybe. But if there's a class, even if it's a $50 class or you know, one of the visiting masters that run into hundreds of dollars, we're happy to help people when we can. Thank you, Tim. Um, one of our other groups that's been in the Guild for quite a while, but is now getting formally folded into the Guild in a bigger way, and we're trying to incorporate it into our educational program is our CNC SIG. Uh, and Rich Bader is here, and Rich uh, has kind of taken the lead on trying to get things organized from that perspective, and maybe like have him say a few words about that group and what's going on and how people can get involved. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, uh, many of you know that there's been a CNC machine that's been hiding in the closet for the last couple of years. It was a donation arranged by Craig Jones, who's the chair of the SIG. Uh, it hasn't been deployed. There aren't any training classes. There's been some teasers, uh, but with the studio being fitted up and some extra space, we thought that this was a good moment to try to pull things together. So four of us are, have been active lately, uh, part of all members of the CNC SIG, myself, Craig Jones, Vince uh, Corbin, who's here tonight as well, and Dave Smith, a professional who just moved back from Austin. And we've been working with uh, Gary Weber and the education group and Doug and Steve to try to figure out what the CNC program is gonna look like. So what we have identified is two courses so far, Education is a big piece of this. One will be an intro to CNC class. What is CNC? Who might want to use it? And why would you want to get involved in that? And then assuming you find something interesting in that class, that'll be a demonstration class. We'll then have an operations and safety class where you'll get together, come to a class, we'll have instructors, and you'll walk away with a piece that you cut yourself on the machine, learn how to do it. We're hoping to put together a mentor program as well. So those people that are trained will have a mentor that can help guide them through additional experience on the machine. And then we're gonna figure out shop attendance and all the rest of it. But the goal is to get people excited about CNC, trained on how to use it safely and uh, have access to the machine. We now, uh, tomorrow, uh, Friday, we're gonna take a look at plans for where the CNC machine's gonna go in the studio. We've already seen a draft of those plans. We're very excited. And even more exciting is Craig Jones, the master of having CNC machines drop from the sky, has found that we could get a three by five machine, a large size machine from Legacy for free, $17,000 machine, all we have to do is pay shipping and handling. It's really quite minimal. So we're working on seeing if we can make that happen as well. Right. Um, we, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So 
what's happened? How can you participate? Well, there is a CNC SIG mailing list and Google group that's recently been activated. If you'd like to find out more about what's going on, you can go to a link on the web page where it says SIGs and down there it says, I want more information and sign up and you do that. And a mail goes to Ed, I get a brownie point and then I get to uh, sign you up on the mailing list. Uh, we're probably going to work. Our goal is to have a pilot introduction to CNC class run in August. We'll do that for some of the members to get a feel for whether it works. And then in the fall, we'll start, uh, we'll actually start the classes. Can I get a show of hands of how many people might be interested in attending an intro to CNC class? One, two, three. Hey, Vince, come on. One, two, three, four. How many on the screen? We, I can't see on the screen. Hands up, how many's interested? Let's see them. One, two. Ah, uh, Gary, thanks, another Four, ringer. Five. All right. Hey, we got two classes worth already. Thanks for your time, appreciate it. How'd I do, boss? You did great, Good thank job. you, thank you. Well, as many of you know, and I'm sure everybody in this room certainly knows that we're in the midst of a capital campaign to fund uh, the improvements to the studio, to make improvements to our education, uh, programs and to make other improvements in the main guild shop, the, the one that we've had for a number of years. There are a number of people who continue to this perform above and beyond. Steve Poland, Gary Weaver, Abu, Paul Ehrlich, uh, Tim, all these people have taken on assignments to um, make sure that that space is outfitted properly and with all the electro, proper electrical and lighting and all the appropriate equipment and the coursework gets programmed into that space because that's how we ultimately are going to pay for that space is by improving the offerings that we have here in the guild and and the revenue that's generated from that. Um, I'd like to have Jesse Smith, who I think is online, uh, just give us a quick update and uh, a rally cry for donations. Uh, as we sit here today, we have... Um, $61,280 donated, um, but that comes from a relatively small pool of our total membership. And ideally, I'd like to see 100% of our membership donate something, you know, it, and it's whatever an individual person can donate. Um, if you can donate $10, do $10. If you can donate 1,000, donate 1,000. But Jesse, tell us how it's done and tell us what you need. Sure. Thanks. Um, you know, it's interesting that you start off with, uh, you know, the, the small donation or the large donation. Gary uh, uh, sort of came up with a, a, an interesting strategy. He and John Sheridan were, were talking about the possibility of targeting our effort to uh, do, uh, donor levels, whether it be small or large. And there really is an opportunity out there to reach out to folks at what works for them. And, and that's really the way we want this campaign to be. It shouldn't be just, you know, how can we squeeze out that uh, last dollar out of the turnip? I mean, we know that we've got uh, well over a thousand members now, and folks uh, have a variety of means across that population. And it's really, uh, what can we do to uh, have them? And really, the, what I want to do each time I, I, I talk to folks uh, over the next several months is I want folks to look at what the Guild means to them. Uh, and hopefully there's a motivation there for them to find out, okay, if it means this, can I, how does that translate into a dollar donation? And, you know, for me as a, as a small uh, craftsman uh, business uh, operator and also someone who's, um, you know, has my own work for uh, whether they're gifts or furniture around the house or, uh, a number of projects like that. I, um, uh, I find the guild to be, the guild and the studio to be uh, uh, an incredible place for me to learn, 
uh, there's good camaraderie with folks that um, uh, as I spend time as a shop attendant or whether I'm in there working uh, myself, uh, it's, it's a good place to work with people. Um, it's, uh, for me, it's been a, a totally positive experience uh, and I, I really don't see it um, uh, doing anything but continuing. I, for one, have not spent as much time with classes as other people have. And uh, so I think there are people out there uh, that are, are, are um, uh, have had some successes with classes. And I'd like to find, uh, I'd like to find a way to reach out to them and get them to reflect on the uh, experience that they've had. And so uh, really what, uh, I, you know, I know maybe tonight here I'm preaching to the choir, but um, uh, but uh, it's it, as Ed says, we're, uh, you know, we're a little over 60,000, which means I'd say we're close to halfway there. Uh, 75 is halfway there. So that that feels close uh, to me. Um, we've been doing it for a couple of months now. Um, the summer is going to be a slow time. Uh, we know that uh, it's seen by how many people are attending uh, this month's uh, general meeting. But, um, uh, you know, we, uh, we're, we're trying to find some ways to, uh, uh, to, to reach out to folks. Uh, one of the things that I'll be working on when I get back in early August is, a, um, is a, an easel that, uh, that we'll have at the studio and we'll now begin to have some real plans and uh, pictures to, um, to begin to add some, you know, some color to, uh, to what we've been saying in print uh, up to this point. So um, I, I ask you all, if you haven't given to, um, uh, to step up and give uh, now, uh, give it a level that works for you and, um, uh, and if you can, um, uh, reach out to me. And if you would like to tell a story of why the Guild uh, has a certain place in your life, um, I certainly would like to share some of those stories as well in the, in the coming general meetings. Just a, a couple of minutes, a couple of sentences if you just want to do it uh, in writing. But uh, uh, help, help me reach out uh, where you can. And with that, Ed. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Jesse. I, sure. Again, I, I, I just want to emphasize that, you know, th this particular component of the campaign is really focused on our members. There are other plans to reach out and touch the community and touch grants, write grants and those types of things. But the really important component when you go to the community and when you go to these grant giving organizations is the participation of your members. And I think if we can get that participation level up, we never have to tell them that, you know, Ed only donated a dollar. But what I would love to be able to say, we had 95% participation of all of our members uh, in our capital campaign with our membership. I think that would go a long way in our next steps towards raising funds. So it's, it's we have to fund what we need to do to make the improvements today, but we need to think long-term about where we want to be two, three, four years from now. So it, this is a this is part of a this is the start of a bigger picture campaign. Um, I, I saw Steve and Gary. I don't know whether Abu do do either of you uh, want to say anything about the improvements or the things that are going on in the studio? Any announcements that you'd like to make either way? Gary, Steve, go ahead. You're muted, Steve. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm unmuted. Um, we just had a, a little session with the people who are working directly on this. Uh, we're going to be meeting once a week to make sure that uh, we're making progress and that everybody knows what that progress is or what questions there might be. And um, I just reported that uh, 
we have number one, we've got the electrical improvements under contract. So we'll be getting all new lighting and uh, adequate power distribution in the studio. Um, we've got a work party coming up on the first to go in and remove the uh, existing ceiling panels to give the electrician uh, free reign in there. And uh, so far there's three of us. It'd be nice to have a couple more. Um, we've got a contract completed on uh, providing an upgraded security system for the entire facility. Uh, we're starting to look at uh, a key access system or a wireless access system. Um, so it's easier for uh, hopefully a growing number of SAs to be able to check in without overpowering our little uh, key lock box. And uh, we're getting ready to, uh, to move on some casework uh, to go into that space. So there's, there's a lot going on right now, and there certainly are going to be some volunteer opportunities uh, that we'll keep uh, posted so that you can participate uh, as well as uh, hopefully providing some donations. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Gary, did you have anything you wanted to add? I think just very quickly, um, there's so much going on, it's almost hard to, um, uh, to condense the information, but uh, you know, we're well on our way, I think, to um, having a good platform foundation for what's going to be the opportunity to really uh, expand uh, what we're doing in education in the Guild. Uh, we've got a bunch of new equipment that's ordered. We've received some other equipment through donation. Um, we are putting together uh, a plan to start with classes effective October 1st. We have a project team uh, led by Tim Moore and, um, and Mike Sandman. Um, that is building the first six workbenches that are going to be in there. Uh, we're going to have a team that's going to be working on stools. We're going to have a team that's going to be working uh, with Steve on, on the shelving and cabinetry. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just exciting what we're on the brink of. And some of us can step up and, and take leadership roles, and we're trying to do that. But we can't do this without the support of the majority of this, of this membership. Um, I, I really encourage folks to think of themselves not just as members, but as owners. This is your guild. This is our guild. And um, these are difficult times for a lot of folks financially. But this is also a time where we really need to have folks step up the best they can, however they can, to help support this and uh, move, move this forward. So it's an exciting team. Uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, many of us are happy to be here and, and taking part in the ride, but we can use all the support we can get. Thank you, Gary. And glad to see you're up and around. No problem. Okay. Um, let's see. Speaking of meetings, this is um, next month, there will be no general meeting. We're going to have our picnic, and the picnic is on the 24th of August, which is not our normal meeting uh, week of the month. Uh, it will be the, at... Uh, it's the 23rd, Ed. It's Tuesday, the 23rd. Can someone check the newsletter? Because I think I took that right out of the newsletter. But uh, Tuesday the 23rd? Tuesday the 23rd. That is the regular time then, right? No, it's the no the regular time is uh, should have been uh, the 16th. Yeah. OK. All right. Yep. So it's the 23rd, and it's at Tiger. Uh, Summer Lake Park, where we've been the last couple of years. Um, setup will begin at five. Um, program, there's really no program, but social and, you know, eating whatever we brought will start immediately thereafter and we'll hang out until everybody's ready to go uh, and the place is cleaned up. So I would encourage you to bring your yourself, your significant others, your kids, if you have them. There is a playground not too far away. Uh, so I uh, look forward to seeing you there next month. Um, we do have a volunteer of the month uh, to award this month, uh, Dave Wiper. Um, he's getting one of the first new, newly created, newly minted uh, volunteer of the month awards. Uh, Vince, I brought two of them. Vince picked up one of his. Vince was a recipient two years ago. 
one year ago and we didn't have them ready for anybody, but uh, the, uh, I got two of them done uh, to bring tonight. There's another 45 sitting in my shop, ready to go. They're, they're all cut. They're all, they all have their aura mask on them, ready to be carved. And uh, we'll be, uh, they'll be uh, available for those who already uh, received the award, but didn't get their block of wood and for future recipients. Um, I don't know, Dave, Car uh, Carol, do you know, Dave? Um, he's, he's just involved in everything from what I understand. Uh, but, uh, you want to say anything about him for the, for the record? <laughs> I didn't, I, I couldn't find it. That's the problem. So yeah, I don't, um, Dave's uh, pretty active with Toy Build. He's also been active in other things. He volunteers for a lot of our, um, the, like when you're gathering the guilds, the events, those things. He's a very quiet behind the scenes kind of person who shows up to help out. He loves doing the birdhouse building. Um, so he's just one of those people that's not up front. You don't really notice him, but he's usually there to help out. Is so, going to see him? We got a birdhouse bill coming up, or uh, he may be there on Friday for toys. I'm not sure if he's. I can't remember if he signed up or not. You want to take this? I'll take it, it to him. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple of uh, general housekeeping things. There is a proposal to amend our bylaws. Uh, we're gonna. I'm proposing that we add a 13th member to our board. Uh, that position or that member would be the immediate past president. Um, this year, Steve Poland, who was the president for the last several years, was not a voting member of our board. I think having that continuity on our board is important. Um, that, that motion or that uh, proposal was adopted by the board at their last board meeting. It's going to be published in the uh, weekly blast. It'll be on our website. Uh, theoretically, the general membership needs, I think, 10 days or 30 days. I don't know what it is, but It'll be 10 days. It'll be ready for adoption at our next general meeting in September. Um, so if there are any questions about it, uh, you can contact me or one of the other board members, but it's a pretty straightforward uh, amendment to add as a voting member, the immediate past president. That'll bring our, our board membership up to 13. Our quorum stays at seven, so. Uh, and then, Al, I think we have some show and tell. I would encourage everybody to bring show and tell uh, to these meetings. Uh, you gonna bring that over here, Al? Okay. This is a bandsaw box. Um, bandsaw box. Of Ed Ferguson on Wednesdays, the bandsaw group going now. And I missed the first couple of uh, days of it because I was on another project. So I did this one at home. Mine's done completely different than the way they started because they uh, cut on an angle and I forgot to do that. So all my cuts are straight. And then I had the, uh, this design is uh, from the yin yang bowls that we did last last year, two years ago. And I laid awake at nighttime trying to think about a, a heel, making a heel like a uh, high, high, high heel, I guess that's what it is. So that's my interpretation of that. And it also allows that to stand up a little bit. Uh, and what are we going to keep in there, Al? Jelly beans? I don't know. I think this is a donation. It's a donation. I think, isn't that what those, they're making them for, Ed? <laughs> so, yeah, I got enough. And, you know, and the wood is what? Oh, the, the wood. Um, I didn't know how I was going to make the, the, the foot part. So I just got a, a two by six. And that's all that was, is a two by six. And I had a piece of walnut. And I uh, glued them together before I made my cuts. And then th this piece was added on afterwards. So, 
I thought you were going to say some exotic maple or something. Yeah. <laughs> I know it looks it looks terrific. So it actually is a practice piece, and it, it turned out pretty fair. I like it. Good job, Al. Thank you. Our our money man Tom has some words of wisdom. I, I want you to focus on his name tag, please. Okay. Uh, if you've been in the shop, I don't know if you noticed this big old crate back by the sliding table saw. Uh, Grizzly reached out to us and donated $900 credit for um, any machine we wanted for the studio. And Abu reached out to him and said, well, we kind of want a joiner. And that's kind of more than $900 and we'll pay the rest, but that's what we want. So Grizzly came back and said, okay, here it is. And Abu sent me the invoice. That's why I'm up here. I got the bill for it. And the best part of the bill was the joiner and shipping. The total was zero. Oh my God. Love it. Nice. So thanks Grizzly. We need to make sure we get that in the newsletter or in some sort of announcement and then make sure we send it to them to let them know that we've, you know, made that acknowledgement. So, yeah, Facebook page too. Very good. Very, very good idea. Okay. I think it's now time for the show. I'm going to turn it over to Joe Wheaton uh, to introduce our speaker. And it's all yours, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, it's a real great pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, uh, Martin Blatch. I hope I pronounced that right, right Martin. Um, but Martin, uh, I first came across Martin on our uh, Zoom that we do for Project Build. And Martin was on the Zoom with us one day and he showed us a table that he was had done. And everybody, everybody in the Zoom was just, mouth agape. We were all just amazed at the quality and the beauty of the work. And I have been trying to get Martin to uh, do this presentation for some time. And I unfortunately have succeeded. And Martin is one of our own, one of our members. And I, I really like to do our own members. And I think that it's really cool that we have so much skill and so much talent and so many people that we can draw on and we don't seem to do it enough. Um, but uh, Martin is an example of the kinds of skills that our members have. And I think that when you see this, the work that he's done here, uh, you will uh, have the same response that the people in Project Build did. Uh, Martin, I'm gonna let you take it away. Um, uh, what we'll do is with questions is uh, they'll either uh, people can, can on the Zoom can send them into the chat and uh, people there will uh, just raise their hand and uh, and Steve will uh, I'm sorry Ed will um, uh, will pass them on to you so without further ado here you go buddy go for it thanks thanks Joe uh, thank you everybody so uh, I promise not to keep this too long and to let you get over to uh, somebody lab, I think, uh, to get your pizza and beer. Um, let me get my uh, sharing going. So I did prepare a, a presentation and uh, I believe that everybody sees the title slide here. Yes, thank you. So I want to be talking, I will be talking about the, the making of the Columbia River table and uh, how I got there. So uh, this is the tabletop and a uh, large part of my, of my presentation is going to be on how actually I went around doing this. But I do want to introduce my, myself a little bit. So I am Martin Blach and I do respond to uh, uh, many names. I have been called uh, Martin, and um, I have been called Vlach and I have been called Black. I'm good with all of those. I was born in Prague uh, in 1950. And here's another uh, close up. And I want you to remember the shape of the river because that comes in handy in a moment. And that little red star is in fact where I was born 
And I went and looked at that house and it turns out that there is a dentist in there right now. Now, I was born in 1950. I finished high school and in 1968, the Soviet army invaded Czechoslovakia. And I have not actually seen these scenes because I have by pure chance left with my parents on a camping trip to Austria the evening of the invasion. Well, uh, many stories there that I like to talk about, but I ended up for one year at the University of Illinois with my father. Then we moved to University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada, where I did my studies. I did computer science, I did electrical engineering. I, I went all the way through to get my doctorate. I worked in Ottawa for a while. And uh, 18 years later, I moved to Portland, Oregon uh, to start a business. And I, was, uh, I joined several people here. We started a company called Analogy. And at that company, I built uh, simulation software. I developed a computer language. Uh, I wrote compilers, et cetera. I started another company in 2000s. And uh, eventually, uh, I retired in 2016. And I have been doing a lot of volunteer work since then. SCORE is one of the things I do. And uh, I am a certified business mentor at SCORE, advising small businesses and nonprofits. And I have probably worked with some 200 people over the time and helped them with starting their small business, about 50 nonprofits out of those. I work with a small, small organization called Nueva Sonrisas. We go down to Guatemala once a year to provide preventive oral health care services to children. And I help nonprofits by being a facilitator for strategic planning meetings. But what we're here today for is woodworking. I have totally surprised myself in 2016 uh, by deciding that I want to do woodworking. And the CheckMac, uh, I'll see how that goes, why I am CheckMac. Let me tell you the inspirational story of how it came that I built a table. Probably six years ago, seven years ago, my wife said that she wants new bar stools. And I thought, okay, but didn't we talk about remodeling our kitchen? So we did that and the remodel was, was nice and successful, but there was the space and that's when I decided to build a dining room table for it. And eventually I was inspired by the Portland Concourse B. I don't know if you remember, there was a Columbia River inlay in the floor on the entire concourse. And I decided I want to build a table like that. So that's how it came out to be about five years later. Now, <laughs> the bad part about this story, we still have the same bar stools in our kitchen. So I often tell this uh, to my score clients, this is, this is what people think a path to success is. But of course, that's not how it works. That's how it works. And I often tell uh, my clients that I cannot really, and this, is, this, this applies to this woodworking that I'm doing, that I cannot really tell you too much what to do, but I can certainly tell you all the things that I did wrong along the way. So I hope that I will remember uh, to mention those. Now, I, when I decided to build this dining room table, I have had a little bit of experience with uh, building some, some furniture when I was a student and didn't have any money back in the late seventies. But since then, I didn't do anything. So I decided to join the guild and uh, see uh, what I can learn. Now, this was my very first project. This was a railing in our house. And I did that on a, uh, on a, on a, on a saw that the contractor left in our garage. And I didn't have any training. And I was scared shitless, literally, to try to, to work on that bandsaw. So, uh, but it was a success. Uh, I did go on and I built my, uh, this was a big, the, the, the very first project I did for my shop. Uh, I built some cabinets. Uh, 
So the shop, I call it a shop, but of course we all know it's a garage and our cars stayed all of three days in the garage. We finally cleaned out everything out of the garage. The cars went in and three days later, I decided to do a shop. I did some carpentry project for my daughter. I built a bird um, a planter box. Then I got a little bit more ambitious. I, uh, create, I, I made a cabinet for our living room that my wife requested to fit into the space. And then I built a corner shelf inspired by a tree that is down, 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 the, hall, down the hall here. Um, this, this caused me many sleepless nights to figure out how the heck to do that. So learning, uh, you, you talked a little bit about the importance of the education. So I looked back, I spent maybe thousand dollars on courses at the Guild before I started actually uh, building something. Uh, now, after this, I started getting serious. You, you can perhaps recognize the, the pedestal of this, of, the, uh, of this table. This is, I built this for my daughter. Uh, and I keep on telling people that, uh, I don't know which way it goes, but I said, I say that I took a fool on as an apprentice, or maybe I became an apprentice to a fool because I am completely self-taught other than the, than the courses that I took. This is an example. This is, this is I built a complete prototype uh, before I actually went and bought the hickory and did that table. Now, here is how I started to go about learning about epoxy. Epoxy. Here is my accent. I just learned the other day that it, that it, it should be epoxy. Uh, Fine Woodworking had an article and I, did, I read the article and I decided that's what I want to do. And I wasn't smart enough to do my own pattern. So I just did uh, what was in the article. And there is an example of the cutting board that was my, my very first real piece within, with uh, epoxy. Now, I ran into some problem and I want, to, I want to say this, you might not see it, but Christopher Moore is the, uh, is the author of this article at the Fine Woodworking Magazine. And I ran into some problem and I am basically an introvert and I don't know what happened to me, but I wrote him an email and asked him if he can help. And he was perfectly happy to help me we had a Zoom call. He, were, he has a shop out in uh, Long Island somewhere in uh, New York. It was a very, very nice fellow. Now, I needed to learn all kinds of techniques. And this is a, uh, a step stool that I designed, uh, uh, which that is an inlay that is inspired by an alpine meadow. You can see the, you can see the waterfall and, and kind of the flat area of the meadow and more waterfalls. And on my website, which I will show you later, this is actually inspired by a place out, out, up on Mount Rainier. So uh, that, I guess that's where the idea came to me. Uh, now, here, things are getting a little bit bigger. And I mentioned earlier, if you can uh, remember the, uh, uh, the river that I showed in, in, in Prague, that is the, the Bltava River in Prague. And it's already beginning to look a little bit more like the table that I eventually built. So uh, this table, I decided that I need to have a project during the pandemic. And when the pandemic was announced, I was going to build a prototype and I went down to Home Depot and I bought a bunch of construction grade four by sixes, four by sixes and stuck them in my garage. And they were, they sat there for a year uh, drying out before I actually got to it because I spent almost all of my time during the beginning of the pandemic helping out small businesses. So after I built the table, I have a few more projects that I did. There is this, uh, this uh, bench that I actually uh, 
uh, that I did after, and I showed it at the at the gathering of the guild. Another another concept. Uh, my very first commission, I got a guy at the gathering of the guild liked a, a, a board, so I sold it to him, and he came to pick it up in my house. Um, more cutting boards. These are little simple projects. A trivet with, with, with experimenting with colors and a very, very kind of a nice, nice piece here. Um, inspired by the string of beads plant. Uh, so color. Uh, I did start with blue for the waterways, that's kind of clear, but I like to experiment with stuff. And I, in fact, uh, I, I do a lot of test boards and all kinds of colors. This epoxy I, uh, I use based on the article from white, fine woodworking, I use Mixol for the colors. And you can see I, I started with some very simple patterns and it, it gets progressively more interesting. So designing the table, how did I go about it? So first it took me quite a while to decide how big it should be. And I did all kinds of research and I finally settled on having the table be 48 inches, four feet wide by 78 and well, it's 76 in fact, but this is a prototype. I am planning to build another one out of Hickory. Now, uh, I plan to have four extensions so that we can sit up to, I think 18 people. I have the space for it, but uh, I don't want to have that table uh, that long. I had no idea how to go about the extensions, but now, Here's, a, here's another plug for education. Kelly Parker gave a master design class about three years ago. I took that class. We talk about my idea and she suggested instead of doing extension somewhere in the middle of the table or having leaves on the side just to build extra tables. So that's what I'm going to, to be doing. And the built table table was the, was the first one. Uh, and the support for the table that came out of fine woodworking uh, in the in a 2017 uh, issue. Uh, that Martin? is out of the fine woodworking. Hey, Martin. Yeah. This is Joe, uh, did you say you were going to build then like another table so that you would then butt them up against each other? Is that? Yes, that is correct. So there will be a large table and a four small uh, 18 inch extensions. So. Four feet, you, you will in fact see the first one in okay. a moment, okay? How it's okay, cool. All right, great. So this is what it was like in the, in the fine woodworking magazine. It just drove me nuts. I could never remember what I'm doing. So I actually use SketchUp for everything. So all, I am horrible about sketching by hand. So everything I do is in SketchUp including that, those tree shelves, all of that, I designed that in, in, in SketchUp, even all the curved services, et cetera. And of course, that has the nice idea that I can, I can move it around and rotate it. And I, do, I made for myself side views and front views and side views so that I have all the dimensions there. I print this out. I have a booklet of, of all the details that goes in, go into the garage. Uh, and uh, every little piece with all kinds of dimensions on it uh, have little details so that when I'm working on it, I have it right in front of me. Uh, now I, I do the cut list by hand. So just a spreadsheet. Uh, no matter how hard I try, I always make some kind of a mistake. I don't know how people do that, but uh, uh, it's almost impossible. So one of the lessons I have learned that I cannot possibly ever decide on the fly that maybe I should make this a little bit deeper or a little bit longer. No, because if I decided on the fly, somewhere else, something will go wrong. So I have now trained myself. I will always go back to my SketchUp and I will change everything on the SketchUp, including all those details, reprint it and take it back to the shop. 
that's one of those lessons uh, and I still keep on learning it. Okay, so I had no idea how do you put this table together. So I do a lot of YouTubing and this is, this is my garage. I had a little two by five workbench that I built by hand in 1978. And that one still exists, but I built a, another larger top on that. And this is how I started putting together uh, the tabletop. It's constructed by, I think these, these are the four by sixes that I ripped and uh, made planks out of that. Uh, I put it together all along the way. My, my clamps are the end clamps on pipes. I couldn't get long enough pipes. So or, I don't have enough space in my shop to keep the long, long pipes standing up. So these are joint, joint together. Uh, there is that final glue up. And here is the tabletop. I'll get back a little bit to how I did the, uh, the surface routing. I will show you uh, how that went uh, a little bit later. Now, uh, this actually is a photo from that small table that I built for my daughter, but this is, this is how I do it. I built all the pieces together uh, and uh, finally put the pedestal together. Uh, and here it is in the, in the, in the front of our, uh, out of our living area. Now the river has to go into it. So I tried several different, different techniques for the routing. So on this piece, I started by cutting myself out templates out of a quarter inch MDF. And of course I had the problem what to do with the islands because how do you, how do you build the islands so the islands that don't fall out of the template. So I ended up using this technique of putting everything together and these little blue tapes hold little pieces in there because that MDF is very bouncy. And when I, when I do routing against it, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a pain, but that's how I did this chair, this, this step stool. I already built three step stools, uh, one for my grandson, one for our kitchen, and one is waiting to be sold to somebody. On the Vltava table, I still went ahead with doing a template. Now I did the islands a little bit differently. You can see this area over here, there is an island and that island in fact consists of the main river. And then to save on the MDF, I cut out the other piece and then I have it carefully aligned uh, to hand route out the pattern. So this is the Vltava River table. Now, when it came to, to, the, to the final table, I started doing the templates and I realized I am never ever going to get to that. So I decided that I'm going to try to do free hand routing and do it by gluing a pattern onto the table and then hand route through the paper. Okay, so uh, for this, for this, uh, uh, for this bench, I decided I'm going to try to hand route it uh, against a pattern, but I don't like the result because on the river, when it's wavy, it's okay. Natural rivers do that, but this I wanted to have a little bit smooth, so I need to do it another way. I started building some of these trivets, and well, that's where a Shapeoko uh, CNC came in. So I bought myself a CNC machine. And that's what I plan to be using uh, going forward. I did look into the idea of using the Shaper Origin handheld CNC machine. Uh, the the, the shape, shape Oco, I bought a, I didn't want to dink around with building it myself. So I bought the pro version for about $3,000. This machine is also $3,000. I don't think it's worth uh, the trouble for that tabletop. And, I, and uh, the reason for that is that there is quite a bit of changes of, uh, of bits. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, oh, and by the way, the routing in the end, by the time I got to routing it, it took me only about four hours to route the whole table. 
So building the pattern for, the, for this uh, machine, doing the computer work ahead of time would take me longer than to actually cut it. So a uh, little bit about how I, how I did that, uh, that pattern. So I decided, so here you can see the main table with the four extensions. So Joe, you asked how the extensions will be and that's the concept. Uh, so I go to Google Maps, I, this is Portland. I built, I put a little bit, uh, I, I put a rectangle on it. This is out in, in PowerPoint. And I moved that rectangle around until it seemed right, until it pleased me aesthetically. Uh, there is a lot of that going on here. Now, I ended up uh, doing a 106 by 65 kilometers for the main, the main table at 64 DPI. That gives me the 5,000 by 3,000 pixels. And I started thinking, how am I going to route it? Well, it turns out that one sixteenth of an inch router, which I used for quite a few of those rivers, uh, corresponds to four pixels. And four pixels are 62 meters on the ground. And this will become important when I show you a little, uh, little uh, uh, trick I put in there. So where did I get the map? I went to OpenStreetMap. It's an open source free map of the world. Uh, I had to extract the data because there is an enormous amount of data. I used the overpass API that is associated with OpenStreetMaps. Then I extracted the data. I put it into a GPS visualizer, another online tool uh, to manipulate the data initially, uh, to check it, to see if things are fine, get the exact bounding box. Then I went back to OpenStreetMaps and I was iterating back and forth, exporting as uh, SVG files. Then I used Inkscape to man manipulate those uh, files. I needed this process to be repeatable. So I actually wrote Python scripts to manipulate the SVG data. A lot more Inkscape work to, to get rid of unnecessary data, unnecessary detail, export to PDF, use Acrobat. Uh, this is an example of the API to extract the waterways. There are 140 lines of code in there. That, that took me days to get this right. And when I do Inkscape, I actually did every single river uh, individually, because if I make a mistake, I don't want to mess up the entire whole thing. So, um, so I have all these, I have learned enormous amount about the names of the rivers over here. So finally I got a PDF and uh, this is what it looks like. This is in fact, if you printed it, that would be the, 48 by 76 inches. The, the little red star is where our house is. And next to that little house, there is a little creek down here in our backyard. And that creek is about three feet across, but I put it on the table. That's, you know, in real life, it would be 62 meters. But uh, this is the little artistic license. So I made a poster out of it in, in Adobe. This is one page of the poster. This is in fact up on Sauvy Island with the Magnova channel. Um, I ended up with 50 pages to cover the table. Uh, so I used every chipping labels and glued them on top of the wood. Now, the, the, the nasty problem is how do you remove the table afterwards? Now, I tested it because I prototype everything. I had these labels back here. I slapped it on a piece of wood and then I just peeled it off. But those labels were four years old. And when I, when I bought new labels, they made a much better glue. And by the time I routed through this and I needed to take the labels off, it took me about four hours. And I didn't know how to do it. I was just one piece at a time. Finally, I had a dropper with alcohol and I dropped alcohol into it. And that finally, I found the technique to do that. So that was a, that was a little unfortunate. Okay, so here goes the routing. And also cleaning. I'll run it at the same time. 
Are you using then a, like a 16 inch bit here? Is that what you're using so, in that router? Yeah. So what I did was that I started with a 164th, one 16, yeah, yeah, 16 inch bit, uh, quarter inch deep. Uh, and I routed the outlines over everything. And some of the rivers are just done by the 64, uh, 16 of an inch uh, bit. Now I did use, uh, for some of the stuff, you, you could see that the uh, the shavings got stuck in those little channels. So that's why I had to blow them out and uh, use my uh, the, the shop dust collector uh, to pick it up. Uh, and so I did this the, the outlines first, and then I went uh, with a, I actually used, I, I have all the sizes, one uh, 16, 332, whatever it is, 1A, it's 1A, 332. Anyway, uh, I have all of those. Uh, some of the rivers are on 132, um, uh, there are some one, one eight. The big river, the Columbia, I eventually uh, routed it out with a quarter inch and even three eighth uh, inch uh, router bit. All of that, uh, you, can, you can see a little bit of progress going on here. Uh, yes. All of that took me, I would, well, it was less than a day. So I probably spent maybe four hours on, uh, on cutting this all out. Um, that, all right. That's, that's amazing to me that that only took you four hours to do that. I, I will, I'll tell you, Joe, I was, I was amazed. I expected this to be a week long project, but it wasn't. And that's why I'm saying that. Uh, to do the the origin, the handheld uh, shape shape or shaper origin, doing the so here when I am doing it by hand, I can actually you know by eye decide well okay this wasn't quite right I'll just cut it a little differently because there is some artistic license involved here. Uh, now I found out early on that there is a lot of bleeding that goes into the into the fibers. Uh, of the wood, so you have to you have to prevent that. And what I ended up with using bags free shellac, and I think I did three coats on this one. I found out since then I can get by with one coat if I do it right. But uh, on this table I didn't do it right, and I have a little bit of bleed through, which hardly anybody notices. And then. In fact, I need to put barriers, and the barriers are done using uh, silicon uh, caulking. And to peel off the caulking, I applied this Johnson wax uh, right around the around the all the waterways. And uh, this is what it looks like. Now the whole table has the silicon the caulking around it. Uh, I of course I ran out, and when I went to Home Depot, I didn't pay in enough attention and I bought a clear uh, caulking instead of white caulking. So <laughs> it's there, it doesn't matter when you see it, it's just fine. I still made that mistake. The last caulking I bought two weeks ago, I still bought the clear one by mistake. All right, one problem I read into was that this, this table was not in fact, okay, let me get on to uh, pouring. So I do use entropy re uh, resins and I use them because that fine woodworking article recommended it and that guy recommended it because these are environmentally sound uh, approach to getting resins and I just I just pay it and uh, 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 get it. I use uh, a clear, what is it? The CCR is clear casting or casting, res clear casting resin and associated with the is the slow cure. They have a slow cure and a fast cure. And a slow cure needs to be done for epoxy that it's more than half an inch deep. 
at that time, I probably could have used a fast cure, but I did a slow cure uh, because I didn't know any better, honestly. Uh, so that's what I used. Uh, there is the 1.2 liters of epoxy. So how did I know how to use, uh, how to get 1.2 liters? Uh, I poured water into the, into the table and then sucked it out and measured the amount of water. And then I added about 20%. Well, I, I added some just to make sure that I don't run out, but this is how I do it now. Uh, if I have a geometric pattern, I will calculate it and add 20%. For whatever reason, 20% is necessary because I did not know this, but epoxy shrinks as it cures, not by much, but enough to matter. Uh, and well, that's where I poured it. And uh, 1.2 liters, there is my epoxy. And I waited for, I think, five days until it cured because it's the slow curing epoxy. That's about right. Uh, now I did, I mentioned that I did have a problem that this table was not perfectly flat. I don't have the right, uh, you know, the right, quite the right equipment. It was about two milliliters, millimeters off at the end. So I kept on, you know, I kept on tilting it and the epoxy kind of was running back and forth. And uh, I ended up with a lot of extra epoxy and I had to keep on adding my caulking to raise the dams because I just didn't know what was going to happen. So anyway, so, here is a, a photo. That's my bench that I built 30 years, 40 years ago. And I added on top of it a large enough structure so that I, in fact, can get myself a, um, uh, what do you call it, a router sled. Now, I did build a small router sled for some of my early pieces but that wasn't nearly stable enough. So I used these struts and I built myself little, little sleds on the side. The sleds use uh, little, uh, how do you call it? What do you call them? It, it's all from Home Depot. Uh, I did spend about, uh, I think by the time all of this got together, I spent about $200 on the router sled. And uh, that, I think I know what I'm doing now. I probably could get it straight enough. I did run into one, what time do we have here? Okay, I think we're doing fine. Uh, I did run into one problem I totally did not expect because another table I had had these boards put together and they, the, the, the table has been straight for 40 years. This table, unfortunately, when I put it all together, because it's pretty cheap wood, and I picked it up on one side, it bends. So I ended up having to put in supports, and you will see the supports on the final table that weren't planned. And if I built another table, I now have an idea on another technique to prevent the bending. But this was part of the problem why I had it off by two millimeters. Things just things just moved. That wood did dry in my garage for, for a year and a half, but it's still, it's, you know, it's, it still is cheap wood. I mean, this is construction grade Douglas fir or Douglas fir. And uh, anyway, so I built this lad. I tried to do some, um, some dust collection that didn't work too well. But anyway, here's an example of it. You can see that it's already picking up nice, uh, nice top on the right here. And on the left, I still have the, um, I have the epoxy build up. So this turned out pretty well. It, it takes like half an hour to do this routing. I, I, I have a little stick on that, on, that, uh, uh, on that router slat and I push it back and forth and I move it by three quarters of an inch and push it back and forth and off I go. Uh, so, if I, so there's yeah. a uh, so there's a router obviously in the box and then yeah. what size router bit is on on the router then like one and a quarter i go to one and a quarter one and a quarter i bought one from from um, uh, uh freud mm -hmm. okay uh, it's a uh, yeah 
And eventually, so this this turned out pretty well. I I have an oscillating uh, six inch oscillating sander, and I spent another couple hours long, longer probably sanding it down. Uh, that does take some time, but uh, you know there's there's a lot of zen involved. You just you know you're in your shop and you. <laughs> You stand then with the router and then you, with the sander and away you go. And finally, for the finish, I just use this general finishes uh, all based uh, polyurethane three coats. So that's what I did on that table. Let me see what else I have here. Okay. That's what it ended up with. You can see these rails underneath the table on the side that I had to add that was unexpected. Uh, and the next photo will show you the extension. So you see the main table, and because this is all proto still prototyping, that Bltava table is uh, an extension on the table. And I build it actually so that this actually ends up as being a little bit of a bar stool. So, there is another photo of it. I do, I do. I use GIMP to do all my image manipulation to remove the background on the photos. Uh, well, there it is. Wow. Uh, um, uh, so you did you tell me earlier, did you say that you were going to build another one of these out of hickory? That is my plan. My wife likes hickory. Our kitchen is made out of hickory. And I have no idea what I'm going to do with it because that hickory tabletop is going to be 250 pounds because hickory is so dense. And I have thought of, uh, you know, having a hoist because this tabletop, my wife and I could barely manage to turn it over. Uh, but with the hickory, it ain't, ain't gonna happen. So anyway, I, have a, I do have a, I do have a uh, website. I, I have this uh, image of selling some of my pieces. So that's my story. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I know you've sold some of these at Together in the Guild, uh, and I, I think that uh, you know this is um, this is a really an amazing uh, uh, piece of work. Um, I got a little bit lost on the uh, computer <laughs> on the uh, uh, on the code to get the uh, get the image onto the table and blown up, but. Uh, uh, the the routing part of it, I would have thought this would have taken days to route the thing. It just looks so complex. I'll tell you, the computer stuff, I, I, I know I was geeking out. I was nerding out on that computer stuff. And I knew that I shouldn't have included it, but I cannot help myself. You couldn't stop yourself. I cannot you? do it. Yeah, right, right. You right. don't know how many pages I deleted. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but I'll tell you, I, I think the computer stuff took me uh, probably two weeks to figure it all out because I had n I, I don't know GIS. I never knew any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Let me let me stop the share. Um, okay. So okay. any Martin, yeah, Martin, that was terrific. Um, and I like Joe was a little bit lost in some of the. Uh, translation of the Python script to the SGV <laughs> over to the API that took it from the open street. Uh, but I think we can all follow along um, at some point. Any questions here from the, uh, from the peanut gallery here at the, at the Mac? I think we were mesmerized. It, I, I had no idea when I first saw that table that you put that kind of effort into it when you said when you initially said it only took me four hours to route the table and then there were a couple of us in the back that said yeah but it took 200 hours of preparation to get to that point so. no no more i have i mean i have to count all the learning i did i mean i yes. literally knew nothing about power tools nor epoxy that's i love to experiment and anyway Thanks. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Martin. It was, it was excellent. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.
All right. So with that, I think we're done. Uh, unless there's any uh, last minute words of wisdom from the peanut gallery. Remember next month, we have our picnic on the 23rd. Uh, check the uh, email blast and the last newsletter for information on where to go. Uh, I wanna thank Don Klein for agreeing to be our greeter at our general meetings here going forward. And I wanna thank you all for showing up. Thank you, everybody. Lucky, lucky lab afterwards for those thank that are you. interested. Thank you. Yes, please remember to put the chairs away and the couple of tables that we took out. <laughs>